We are right now about to board a train to Liverpool to go meet Meatball Molly McCann. First ever English woman to win in the UFC. I have lots of questions. Park Benjamin from Liverpool South Parkway, and due into Liverpool Lounge at 11.40. But it's worth Next it. Next up, we'll be spending Golden 3. She had an orbital bone fracture. Gets taken to hospital. They say to her, we need to have surgery on that. I'm going to let her tell you this story because it's amazing. The fact is, I saw her with a bottle of vodka at the hotel, massive eye injury, partying, and she made her surgery 9 a.m. next day. We are now in Liverpool in a black cab, which makes me feel very London, but it's not just London, it's also Liverpool. And we are on our way to Rotunda Gym. Oh my gosh, I haven't even told you that actually today is around my podcast, Sugar Free Coffee with Layla. So we're gonna record the podcast with Molly today. Oh, is this Lambeth Road already? Oh, there it is. Oh, just right at the front. There she is, I'm in the room with the I'm sorry, I'm sweating. Get why you don't worry, how are you? Good. How's your day been so far? Um, it's fucking tough in this just let me tell you. You look lovely. Thank you, so you. been up about since five <laughs> in the morning. Our interviews are always like quick, short, live. And now we get hours to go and play. Exactly. It's amazing when you watch a fighter's body shape change. Pre-fight, obviously she has to cut weight and get ready for a fight and then now she's walking up and getting stronger. It's amazing. The thing that Pete did it to me last fight camp was my footwork and my boxing IQ. Yeah. But I want a submission in the next fight, so. 12, 6, 7, 4, 4, 8, 9, 10, and time. Playing look on my scooter. Is it yours? Yeah. Do look? I'm pulling skates in the gym, Mo. <laughs> oh my god, that looks so fun. <laughs> People, when I'm riding it, they go. Oh, <laughs> I do have a strange request for you. Okay. I want to feel what it's like for you to take me down. Not take down or punch. In there or on the mat. Step forward. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can I'm see your eyes are changing, Molly. <laughs> look, I'm tiny. Don't Michael. make me look a show on the celly, <laughs> Molly. Like. <laughs> No Taken down by Molly McCann. Survived. This is home, isn't it? This is home. And it's just this entrance sign on the right here, mate. So outside, it might look like nothing, but wait till we get in there. Welcome to my house. So I'll just take you over to my corner first. It's like literally just a little UFC corner. Right, so we've got Adam Ventry, the main man, people's main event. Gonna shock the whales at Cage Warriors Liverpool, September 28th. We've got Chris Fishgold, current oh, UFC is. star. Fishman, say hi to the camera. Hi. How are you? What's happening? Also, you're right. I'm Sorry, I'm a bit sweaty. Yeah. Well, you're Sport, right. yeah, ISO yeah, Sports. Yes. Representing. ISO Sports, oh, yeah. yeah. Hey. I'm all sweaty though, Leila. Patrick Pimley, we call him. The time I had off when I lost killed me. Mm. Watching him go through the same thing because it's not like. He's not training every day. He's training twice a day, three times a day. You just can't fucking punch no one. It was close. He nearly got the finish with the broken hand, you know what how I mean? Like how Soren got out of that submission makes no sense to I anyone. know. There's loads of building sites around here, Leila, because this is like a student club <laughs> centre. We'll be training and every now and then you go, someone's smoking out there. And all the brickies come out and have a, a joint. They fucking painted Bob Marley on the wall, and that's where they all go. And Paul Rip Alex Greenwood, yeah. a scout and left back who represented England at the World Cup. So it's a contrast from Bob Marley to Alex Greenwood. <laughs> Me, Paddy, and Adam can't train if the music's not on. It's like whose playlists on today is how we're feeling. If Paddy's in a bad mood, everyone's everyone's getting fucked because he's in a bad mood. And we've just turned the music down, so we yeah. should probably turn it back up. Yeah. Okay, sounds speed. We can go. Wicked. Hello. Welcome to Sugar Free Coffee with Layla. Um, my guest, now some of you can see this, but some of you are just hearing this, um, is possibly my, well no, blatantly, my most requested guest. Every time I drop a podcast, someone tweets me going, why haven't you talked to Molly McCann? Where's know. Molly McCann? I Get know. Molly McCann on the Consider post podcast. Consider how good we are as mates, Layla. I know. So, uh, what am I, number three? <laughs> you're, I number three you're number three. You're number six. Oh, wow. <laughs> But the thing is, I'll be honest with you, 
I've been really overexcited about doing a podcast with you, possibly because we're friends, but also yeah. because of how inspired I am by you. Like you, I find you so inspiring to the point that it gets, I get anxious and I've been really nervous oh, about really? asking you to do this podcast. No and way. then there's a friend zone thing too, right? Oh, come on. You're and just it's gonna... like, oh, is that, unro- is that wrong for me to ask her? And did it? No, if I was having a bottle of wine and doing it, it'd be even funnier. It would be fun. We have to do that too. Okay. But at the end of the day, I asked you and I you said, said yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And so here you are, Meatball Molly McCann. Let's talk face-offs. Okay. That's the first thing I want to start with because with you, I think it's, there's a very evident difference. And when people watch your face-offs, it's like you drink the spirit of the other person. <laughs> it's something else. People get as excited about your face-offs as they do about the bloody I know, fight. I know. Um, for me, Leila, I always thought if you can get into someone's head before you get in there and take them away from their game plan and just make them think, oh, I'm just going to go and get them, you make the fight easier for me. Mm. And that's more my kind of fight. And I'll always beat someone at that. Um I will tell you this, though. I've been speaking to, like, a, a mind coach, Vinny Shorman, and ever since I lost, I've been speaking to him. And he told me the only the only way you'll lose a fight is if you don't harness your emotion and if you are if you led a... If you fight off too much raw emotion, you need mm-hmm. to harness it. And he said to me, when you go, on, go to this face-off with Ariane, he said, I want you to... Not be all effing and blind and like you normally do. I said, I just want you to be calm. And that's the first time in my whole life that I've done that. Well, you smiled at her at the end. That I, confused the hell out of me. I know. Well, when we... She always knew she was going to have better range than what I had. So when we met, she was there before I was. And her guard was long. So I think... I wanted to take that away from it the second that I stood there. I thought, don't think that you're having your own way with me tomorrow. Like, yeah. I'm I'm in your face. And I just stood there and looked at her. And um, and then I walked away. And Vinny rang me up and he said, why didn't you get in her face? I said, because I just didn't feel like I needed to. I felt really calm and really at, at ease. And that's the difference. But don't get me wrong, UFC London, Priscilla Cachoeira, she... she as a face in, I thought, no, like, no, because the whole crowd went off the red and I thought, I'm getting right in your face there. And Mike Bisbon had that famous comment of, oh, you can tell she's a scouser. <laughs> so, by the way, I got in there. We could see you were talking to her too. Did you Do you plan what you say? No, it was really off cuff. I didn't mean to... I'd always get in someone's head. Mm. But I, I, it just comes naturally. I, I don't think anyone ever plans it, to be honest. But I just said, like... Um, like I told you, in the UFC connected in London, I just said, they, 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 they for me, this is my house. And then she was talking to me in Portuguese, and then I was like, whatever, love, I can't understand you. Um, but, I don't know, the respect is gained once we fight each other. Mm. I can't give them it before we go in, because I'd end up losing a fight. So do you take a lot from a face-off? I do. Yeah. From when I finally see that person... Um, because you've imagined everyone I've ever fought has been from all around the world. I've only fought one English person. Mm. Um, they all seem to be bloody Brazilian, don't I know, they? I know, yeah. <laughs> it's very unfair. <laughs> yeah, so I have to gauge that this is just a woman with two arms, two legs, and I see that because you can, you can magnify their strengths when you're watching tape on them or when you see the highlight videos... But when you see, when you're just two women stood in front of each other and then it's real, I think, oh, actually, you're not going to beat me. So after hearing, like, seeing all the stats, reading about them in the media, it helps you humanise them and see them as that's beatable. Ex- that's exactly it. And nice. I think before I lost, I used to be a lot more ruthless with how I used to think. And I used to think, oh, they're not going to touch me. And then now I'm a little bit more like, well, actually, m- my last three fights, I've needed stitches or surgery after near enough every one of them. And that's saying the level that I'm now competing at. Mm. So your mindset has to change with the level of competition. I'm not going to be able to run through elite level people. Uh, I'm like, I mean, I'll beat them, but I'm not going to be able to beat them up and make it look as easy. I, I would think as what I did 
to the lower scales. So there's been like a, a massive change in maturity in you since UFC Liverpool. I think that's, yeah, that's what you'd say. Let's yeah. talk about UFC Liverpool then. And for a non-fighter, mm-hmm. this is quite a grotesque question in a way, but what does it feel like to be choked out? <sighs> so I was put in the compromising situation and... If someone has your back and they're putting a choke on you, yeah, the face defense is attack the hands. Mm. So the hands that are choking you, you're two on one, try and peel it off, make sure you keep your chin down. And um, and I couldn't reach it because where she had a short choke, her hands were right behind my neck. And at this point, I, I quite on numerous occasions made it known like I would never tap. Mm that's the only way you beat me is by putting me to sleep. And I seen, I seen the crowd and in the UFC, they have like, um, your name shoots around. Yeah, Do you the know, graphics. Like, yeah, the graphics. And I just said UFC Liverpool, UFC Liverpool. And as I'm going out, I put my hands up and you can see it on the video, like I'm going to try and tap or defend and I couldn't and I just dropped them. And then my body goes like stiff as a board, and that's when I was out. But as I'm going out, the lights just go black, 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 black. It's oh like God. from twenty twenty tunnel, nothing. Yeah. And um, it took me a bit of time to come round because it's very unusual for someone to go out with their eyes open. But my eyes were open, so if you can hear Dan Hardy on the on the when he's commentating, he's like, "Oh, she's out, she's out." And Neil Hall did an absolutely horrific job. Like, Gillian Robertson even was like, she's gone. And I was, like, face down, fitting on the floor. And when I come round, I was kind of like, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know I was even in the UFC. It was, I was, like, looking at everything. I'm going, oh, it's UFC Liverpool. Oh, my God. And then I looked at my gloves. And then I was like, oh, am I in the UFC? And then it was like, oh, no. Yeah. The worst possible thing that happened. Did happened. you realise it yourself or did someone have to tell you? It 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 took seconds for me, what do you call it, like coherency to come yeah. back together. It was like five, six, seven. And within about 15 seconds, I was like, fuck. I, when I woke up, I thought I was in Barbados. Like everyone laughs when I tell people this, but I was like, the mat was hot and it felt like sand. Yeah. And I was going to the Dominican Republic the next week and I'd just been talking about Barbados and I was like, ooh, because that oh, feeling yeah. of going to sleep is like a warm Because you asked someone feeling. in the octagon, am I in Barbados? Yeah. We caught that on the yeah, mic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Barbados, yeah, so. Um, yeah, and I just remember a standing ovation from the crowd. Like, I think it's very rare that people choose to not tap. yield and tap. So that's where I was going to next, because you spoke a lot in interviews after that fight about how it was really important to you that you didn't tap and how you hoped people saw that out of everything, at least you didn't give up. Yeah, and some people are going to go, oh, you're an idiot for not tapping. Like, you could, like, I was never going to die. It's very <laughs> uncomfortable. It's not nice. But if you pride yourself on being a warrior, warrior spirit, and a will to win that can't be beat then you are going to fight through everything that you possibly can. And if there was 1%, a 1% chance that her arms would have burnt out like we know happens and I could have survived, that's what I was holding on for. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I guess my question is, do you judge people who tap out? No. No? Um, Mine was very uncomfortable, but mine was a blood choke. Right. So you can be getting people who get neck cranked and strangled, like... um. I think Darren Tills was a dars. Chris Fishgold was a dars. I know, I know, Fishy is one of the toughest men on this earth mm. and the gamest men. And he still tough because he knew he wasn't going to get out. You don't need to go down like you're a hero when you've just put on an unreal performance. But my performance wasn't that great. But I needed to save some face and a bit of e- a pride, the ego might have all rolled. You thought into about him. all of that as you were. Yeah. Really. Hundred yeah. percent. I was like thinking. Not a fucking chance am I doing this. And it's something that mean I mean that like certain people will always say that you're a scouser though because you didn't tap. And I just think You would never have tapped. That no, was never an option. Paul Rimmer said to me, because we knew the girls got their arm bars, triangles, he said, I went, do a tap and he went, You've got 
medical care don't tap yeah obviously i will i'll put it on records i will tap if it's a heel hook or something that's going to blow me knee i'm not too i'm not going to waste I'm it. not a complete idiot yeah like I, if i'm gonna have a year out then yeah then I'll, I'll tap but if it's literally just it's just uncomfortable but it wasn't only that something you know almost as uncomfortable is after that you went and fulfilled all media duties that essentially you didn't have to. Didn't, you well, went and you're did. Not, yeah, you're not really supposed to think when... I had to go and get stitches first. I remember coming to run to you because she was like a safety blanket for me. Thank you. From Cage Warriors, it was like... Oh, like the face you knew. Yeah, and I know how much we care for each other, so I was like, oh. And I just remember being gutted and Caroline Pierce done that interview and I, I really didn't need to. And I just remember being in the chain... I'm not sure if I went for food before I did the interview. I don't think I did. I didn't get time. No, yeah. Um, I just remember trying to be honest and as transparent with everyone as what I can be, and people will love me or hate me for that. And I'd probably say ninety percent of people appreciate my journey, my honesty, my transparency, and the message I try to bring. And you're gonna get ten percent of people who just aren't that into what you're about, which is fine. Do you know what I mean? But. The, the love I got for doing that interview and the amount of grown men who've come over to me said, you had me crying after that interview. I was just like, I just had to be honest. But I remember Leila doing that interview. I walked out the back door and the Pullman Hotel is next to the Echo Arena, now the M&S Bank Arena. And my mum was there and Paige was there. And my mum said, I've never drank in front of my mum because my mum's like, 23 years clean, recovering addict, so I just would never disrespect me. I just seen that as respect yeah, thing, so I mean. I'd never drink in front of her. She sat me down and she bought me a cider because it's what I drink. She went, drink that, get your fucking shit together and go to your after party and go and see your mates. Because I was, like, beside myself. And I was like, oh, oh what a hero, and, yeah. And she was like, no, you're not going to feel sorry for yourself. Look what you've just managed to do. Look at what, take all the positives. Now go and see your friends and your family who've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds following your career. And I was just like, fucking hell, this time in a place, mum. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, just let me have 10 minutes, yeah. you know? But she didn't. And she's the person I aspire to and I look up to. And she just says, Mom, we're cut from a different cloth, you know? Like, you're not going to sit there. So then I went to see all my friends and my family. It all kicked off with all of them because everyone was drunk, emotions was high. Everyone has kicked off and everyone. I was like, oh, I'm going back to the hotel. So I've just gone to the hotel with Paige. And as I've walked in, Darren's just won. Everyone's come back for a party and everyone's looking at me. And I was just kind of tossed to the side like mm. nobody's child. And I went, oh, Paige, I can't fucking handle this. Let's go to Chinatown. I want to get a Chinese. So I've walked in. My face, I'm like looks horrific and the whole of the Chinese has gone because <gasps> they everyone had been to the Echo. A good time to not be recognised. I know. And the ma it, a man and his family came over to me and gave me a hundred pounds in cash. So I mean I can't take that and Paige was like, no, you fucking take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's paying for tonight. And he went, um, Gail, after what you've just been through, no one deserves to pay for their own dinner tonight. Oh, he went, chin man. up, chin up, kid. He was a uh, so uh, he's sponsored one of the lads in our gym before, so he knows all about the fight game. And then it literally took 11 months for me to to gain a bit of, like, self-worth back again. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It was just tough. So how much was that fight, that London, that night, a turning point? And how much were you already on the journey for Molly 2.0, as it were? Yeah, so I would say... We really cracked down hard, like, the 3rd or the 4th of January, and the fight was the 16th of March. Now, I started fight camp at 61 kilo, so I had nine pounds to lose, mm. which I'm used to cutting the night before a fight. Wow. So, for me, there was no pressure yeah. of making weight, and after failing weight at UFC Liverpool, that was the biggest thing in my head. That's probably, I think, why I lost, because I weren't professional and making weight, and my head just fell off, because... I've never, that's never happened to me before. So I just said, like, I'm going to make such a statement on how I'm going to do this. And everything, I put myself out of my comfort zone for everything that I did. So I started training earlier in the morning. So I forced to get out of bed early when I didn't want to get out of bed. 
I added extra runs to my sessions. Um, I was doing. Were you fighting with yourself then? There was so much going on inside, and I didn't know the right blueprint. Mm. I thought I did, and I didn't. So I was like, right, scientifically, what's the blueprint to be strong and to make weight? And we had it. Um, and then we had to periodize sparring, pad sessions, game plan sessions. And I just had this new lease of life, life where every second I was on the mat, I was that scared of getting it wrong. I was just getting it right. And then training, it was shocking everyone. Yeah. And they was like, where's this come from? I was like, it's the 100 days of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. That was 150 days. It's still, I can tell it's still a little bit raw. But do you already look back and go, that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me? Hundreds, but that made me. And I said, it's not the defining moment of my career, but it will help define my career. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was it was humiliating and humbling. Um, but you came But back. you know when you think, they like give me soul, me life and soul to the five weeks in the camp. Mm. And... It was probably the five weeks prior where I'd been celebrating a world title and I weren't in the best shape because I was enjoying a lifetime's work. That set me back. But ever since that loss, I just wired. I, I put a post online and it was a picture of my face after the fight and I'm looking up like that. And I just said, this face is a face of disbelief. Like I couldn't believe I had got to the pinnacle of my sport and failed at the first hurdle. Mm. And I was like, I just promised myself and everyone else, like, I'll never have that face again, albeit I might lose again, but it won't be... You were unprepared to lose. You, yeah. You hadn't prepared yeah. for that. I'm, now you know. Yeah. That, like, I'm really aware, like, the more I'm around fighting and the more I fight, it will happen more more often. So, like, someone will implement their game plan better on a, on a given day. If I have a shit day in the office, it is on the biggest scope ever... Um, I don't go to work, I don't compete five days a week, do you know what I mean? So if football team plays 40 games in a season, if they won 30, wow. Do you know, exactly. Like, do you know what I mean? But, stats are amazing. Yeah, but in fighting, you don't get that opportunity to fight that. So let's talk about UFC London, because that yeah, was... the a, badness is gone, the, the badness goodness is, is there. But, you know, going back to that, going to that fight, things had changed. You knew the camp was 10 million times better than it ever had been. Mm-hmm. But you are going back on a Darren Till card... Oh, my God, so that messed with my brain so much. I was yeah. thinking, oh, I was he my kryptonite? Like, um, <laughs> I was thinking, I was just... There was loads of things, Layla, and I just thought, right, I need to put all these superstitions to bed. So I'd had a fight in Brazil previously, and I was robbed on a decision terrible. So that was a, a loss on my record, but I knew it wasn't a loss. So mm. I wasn't bothered, but I wore black in Brazil. Right. So I thought... I'm wearing black. Mm. and Because you wanted to cancel cause I, out Yeah, because I wanted to cancel out. I thought, right, Darren's there. Same same cards, OK. I was in the same corner. Um, I was thinking... That's a lot of confidence to do that to yourself. I know. And I was thinking, in Brazil, I took an England flag out, whereas normally I'd take my Everton flag out, but you can't in the UFC. Mm. It can only be countries. So then... I thought, I'm taking my England flag out, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. So you purposely did things that you did on a loss in order to break that? Yeah. Wow. I mean, it weren't easy and I was coming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but Conor McGregor said it and I can't quote him, I can't even paraphrase him that well, but it was something to be like, if a superstition can put you off a fight, you're mentally weak. Right. Do you know, like, what, because you put that sock onto that one, that means all the hard... Training sessions, diet, game plan goes out the window because you put your socks on different. Like you were like, no way. I'm and I was like, yeah, shut happen. up, Molly. Do you know what I mean? But then I did it. And but it plays on your mind. It did, and without rushing to the the last fight, the Ari- Ariane Lipsky fight, I done exactly the same thing. All the times that I lost was to a Brazilian, and I was wearing the same color clothes, and like it was in a different country. And I finally put that to bed again. And I think that's why the anxieties was quite high for the last one. But squashing all of that, I finally thought, oh, it's all right. Like, What does it feel like to break your ort- orbital bone and win? Um, well, I think you've seen in the hotel when I was partying until about two in the morning what I felt like. But um, I've never felt, I've never 
quite felt pain like that. Sorry for moving, boss. Um, I've never felt pain like that. Um, I remember what doing the UFC connectors in London with you when you showed a different angle mm. and you hear the crack. Mm. And, um, oh, geez, that one was a bad one. But to push on through and to know the doctor's nearly going to stop the fight, but you've got to keep on fighting. And, you know, you've got four minutes and 40 seconds to fight with one eye. You can't see how far your opponent is, so you're kind of going on peripheral vision or, like, you've been here a million times, so you kind of know how far that person is away from you, but you haven't really got a clue. And um, I literally scaled that fence when that bell went and I flew on my coaches and we all just loved it. So you knew going into that fight, and I don't know how much you allowed that into your consciousness, tell me. Yeah. That if you'd won, had you won, you would have been the first English woman to win in the UFC. Yeah, so when we talk about maturity and the way in which I speak before a fight, I'm very, I'm sure of what I write now because you put it out there to the universe and it's going to come, mm -hmm. but without sounding like a tit or like arrogant or ego. Yeah, or yeah. The ego. So the morning of the fight, I put a post on Instagram saying the picture was me and an England flag and the, the caption is something like tonight England gets its first female UFC win and a performance I'm wavy of and it was more about me than a performance for everyone yeah. else because my man coach Vinnie Shawman said you always talk about doing this for everyone else and not yourself and that's where you need to change that yeah. Because you can't fight for everyone else, you have to fight for yourself. So I put that out there and I thought, yeah, do you know what? I am going to be the first English woman to get a win in the UFC. But there had been that much happening in the fight and I was probably a bit concussed lately. I just didn't even think. And then when Dan Hardy said it, it was amazing for me and him to share that kind of moment yeah. together. And um, I just remember listening to the crowd go off the tits and I was just like... No one can take this bit of history away from me, and to do it in London, yeah, like it's actually given me goosebumps yeah. because the the stage was set for that. Do you know what I mean? I was the first scouser to make the walk at UFC Liverpool, didn't get the win, but I was the first woman to. I wasn't the first woman to make the walk as an English woman, but I was the first Scouse. one to get the win. And the first one to get the win, yeah. and then how much did life change? Because the media went mad for you. After yeah, that moment. um, I don't know. I've always struggled obviously with doing an interview and not and swearing do you yeah, know yeah. what I mean so I had to really start to change that but I was on talk sport I was on um five live I was on all like well the TV state side was crazy about yeah. you too all over America yeah and um I can't remember who it was but if it it was like BBC two which is like your left-wing, conservative, Tory, all of that, talk about Theresa May and Brexit at 8.40 in the morning, peak time, everyone going to work. They go, now we're just going to talk about me, Paul <laughs> Molly. And I was like, what this game from Norris Green is just like, is on. And it really, life changed for the positive and my message changed and the reason why I fight changed that day. And it was for, it changed more, I fight for myself, but the reason that I'm fighting is to change it for the community. Do you know what I mean? And allow the blueprints now there for the girls to do it in England. So you've just gone to exactly where I want to go next. How much has this changed and how much has everything changed since you, a girl who wasn't allowed to chain at a gym? Yeah. Tell me about that time. Um, so what you told, like you went to a gym and you I went, were told I've that. probably gone to say about seven gyms. Boxing gyms, MMA gyms have always let me in. Yeah. Just so that's on record. Because Paul Rimmer goes, everyone thinks you weren't allowed in our gym. And I was like, no, no, no. Um, it was always boxing gyms. And there was a... I always say Amir Khan was the only English fighter to represent Great Britain Olympic Games. I remember watching it and I was 12 years old. And you had like Kelly Home win the double. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And there was like so many... The, the English rowers was winning and we was like a little nation then that didn't have much sports science so we weren't really 
competing with the best of them, do you know what I mean? But I just remember him here, Khan, just a 17 year old lad, got silver. And I thought, no, I want to do that. So around the corner was a boxing gym. And uh, my cousin was allowed to go in every day, he was a lad. And I turned up, I was speaking to this lad called Danny. I was like, Danny, can I ever go? We went, no, girls were allowed in love. So I just used to watch through the window. Oh my God. And um, I just imitate what they was doing. And then he let me in. And then the famous story of, if you've got a gum shield, you can come in. And I showed him my gummy and then he let me spar and I battered one of the lads. <laughs> and then he went, you can come back all the time. But it weren't like I had any one-on-one -on -one time with the coach. Mm. It was just kind of like, right, well, you go on the end. So if you notice, when I fight, I switch stance all the time. Because I'm left-handed, but I fight orthodox because I was never asked, are you left or right-handed? It was like, copy them. There was yeah. no self-pause in the gym. Yeah. So I fight that way. And then, you were not a priority. Yeah. So I've learned to fight the wrong stance still because people didn't want to take time on me. Or the more I had a mirror and I danced in front of that mirror like I was Muhammad Ali, I just thought... But like butter wouldn't melt. I thought I was the best thing ever. I'd walk into the gym and just try and make every coach laugh. And I would never be disrespectful, but I'd like when we talk about what Paddy brings to a session and, and a gym in, in my lad, Paddy Pimbley, then um, I would always do that in a boxing gym just because yeah. I thought I have to prove myself. So I had to be good at everything. Do you carry the weight of responsibility now, especially with being in the media and everything, for women, for young girls going to boxing gym and wanting to be in MMA? Do you think about that and feel that... I feel like I've progressed in terms of responsibility and being a role model. And I didn't really... In football, the FA will overrule and UEFA will be like on your Instagram, on your Twitter. Yeah. If you're, you've got a code of conduct, if you don't act by that way, then you're getting fined, you're getting this and you're getting that. And in boxing and MMA, you don't really have that. So that's why you kind of get people who get in trouble for tweeting something or for posting something. We get in trouble all the time by trolls, not by like a governing body. Yeah. But I just thought, right, I need to carry myself in a way that's true to who I am. Um, I don't change and become like media trained and sit here and, and I, I just don't speak my mind and anything like that. But I need to be a way with... We're conscious of the girls like, yeah yeah that, yeah you feel that yeah and i don't think i've drastically changed but i feel like language you use things that i do if i go out i wouldn't get as drunk as what i used to get when i win who i was do you know mm. like you just have to be aware that people are will try and catch you slipping and and they really will so we're all only human and we may make mistakes and things but you you you're just trying to live the best way that you can We've watched you grow. We've watched your mindset change. We've watched so much happening. How do you now, how do you define success? I remember being asked this, Leila. I met you in October, not last year, the year before. And uh, a little team was following me called Project Success and we ended up doing quite a lot together. And they was like, what, what does success mean for you? And I was like, it's so much... It's so different for so many different people because mm. I was like, if you're a person who suffers with anxiety and depression, getting up, leaving your house and going to the shop could be your Mount Everest. Do you know what I mean? And that is success for you. And I can't remember what I said. Um, but I think success for me now is just carrying myself in a positive way putting good out there and getting good back. Post your Greenville fight, mm -hmm. the interview, I was even surprised because I'm sort of used to the old Molly, as it were. Um, I don't think I swore... I may have swore... I may have no, said shit. Yeah. I can't remember if I used the no, bad but one. but what happened was they were talking about... Um, I think it was Caroline Pierce asked you, you know, who next, where next? And you said the old Molly would have been Shevchenko, give it to me, I'm ready. But the new Molly is just going to focus on improving herself and fight whoever comes her way. Yeah, how much do you have to work at that? How much of that? No, that was just that was pure honesty because I was crying before I'd done the interview because I've just achieved yeah. the dream of winning in America. And I had nothing left to give. I had, I had no adrenaline left. I had nothing. But the BBC was doing this, paid a lot of money to do this 
documentary with me and I know Fully ESPN needed, and all yeah. of them needed this. They all needed the interview and I've never done a win, win an interview in the UFC because when I done my eye, UFC London. Rushed us too. Yeah, so I, there was a lot that I was still waiting for a first yeah. in, in the UFC. And um, everything about that fight I was calm, concise and clear about and the interview was exactly the same and it's just like... I'm going to get there now when I'm going to get there. And now I don't have to rush myself and I've proved my worth. But if you start calling people out, you, you have to be careful what you wish for. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a more patient Molly. Yeah, I've just, yeah. But a more patient Molly that still likes to party, something I've missed and I have to go back there, <laughs> is when you broke your orbital bone, rushed yeah. to hospital, sat there and they said you're going to need surgery first thing in the morning. Yeah. And you were like, cool. I'll come back. Yeah. I'm sure they were like, no, no, you're staying. No. Hey, do you know what, Layla? They went, hey, you can go and have a sleep at home or go and, like, go and sit with your family and that because they could see me phone was going like, boom, 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 yeah. boom. And, um, and we came back and I wasn't... I sat down with my coaches and I bought them dinner. I was like, whatever you want, I'm getting that 50 grand bonus. You can get the £100 steak. It doesn't matter. Because I would just add in my head I was going to get this big bonus. Um, we sat there and I was like, lads, I don't really want to drink. Me, me face is killing me. And then I, uh, I just poured one and then my face was hurting more, so I was like, nailed it bit. <laughs> and by the time Darren had fought, I was like, I'd never been so happy in my whole life. And normally in Liverpool after a fight, everyone's dragging me everywhere. And I'm getting pulled left, right, pillar to pillar. And this time, about... 70 people came back to the hotel for me and they oh, all nice. let me work the room and no one demanded from me and I thought, it's so much easier now. Yeah. It's so much easier, but I don't know. I think I was in my room for 12. So I was back at the hotel for eight. You were not in your room for 12. Was I not? No way. No. <laughs> no I, way. I don't know. <laughs> I was well, like, this is the story I tell you. Like. <laughs> But I just remember I got a... You were back at the hospital for your surgery at nine. Yeah. That was the important thing. Yeah, I had a pizza in my room. Yeah. Didn't sleep. And I just remember I was putting I was putting videos on my Instagram like, this is the price of ambition. Like, my eye was just destroyed. But it made me a, an overnight sensation in the UFC. How much did you notice a difference in friendships, approach and people around you from a loss to a win? No one went hiding in the loss. Okay, good. Uh, my group, I've got about four different friendship groups from university, growing up friends, school friends, football friends and fighting friends and family. So there's me six groups. And they was more proud in how I handled the loss than how I've handled the win. And, um, and in wins... I seen it more when I won the world title. Yeah. I, like I, I dealt with that and I seen Pad, Paddy Pimblett and I've seen Darren Till go through it. I've seen these latchons and these Klingons and I have no time for it. And I'm a lot more direct with people and how I choose to spend my time now. Um, and, and I don't think I'm ever too rude with it, but I'm just like straight, I'm a straight talker. And um, if I know someone's trying to angle something on me, it's like literally... Tell me what you want. If I can give you a kind of if I haven't got time, I'm not going to. But don't don't start trying to say you've been on this journey with me since way back when and all that. But yeah. then my friends are like, you only see certain people pop up when you're fighting or putting pictures up about you when you're fighting. But my mate Lauren said, they're not probably doing that on purpose, but you're not in the forefront of their mind. But when people are talking about you, then they think about they're you. So don't, so don't always take it on the negative and as the bad. And I, I was like, I won't. But when I won UFC London, I couldn't walk anywhere down the street without scousers being let. Yeah, like, yes, meatball. Yeah. And it's still the same now. Uh, when I won in Greenville, um, it's Mike Bisbon, and I forget the other man's name, who was the commentator. I think it's something Fitzgerald or Fitzgibbon or something, but they was calling me the meatball. They weren't calling me meatball, meatball Molly. Molly. It yeah. was like the meatball. And that's what the Scousers say. And um, and it's funny because that's what everyone says. Do you know what I mean? You 
in an interview after you won your Cage Warriors title, which I think is fair to say probably the hardest fight camp you've ever been through, you lost your dad, I hope you don't mind me saying you lost your dad in that fight camp, and um, it was incredibly tough on so many levels and emotionally as well. In an interview after that win, you said, I don't know how to fight without adversity. Yeah. You're in a position now where things have changed. Mm -hmm where, you know, the weight cut isn't a problem anymore and you've put everything in place to fight well without it, without adversity. Mm-hmm. You don't want to create adversity for yourself in order to fight. Yeah, you don't want to, like, give yourself speed bumps when you're trying to race a race. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so when we go back to superstition, UFC Greenville, there was no adversity. So yeah. superstition was playing games with me. Mm. And then I gave it the best performance of my life. So maturity, growing up, um, not having to draw from pain to fight. That's exactly where I want to take you. Yeah. I almost want to sort of say, can you look back at that fight camp, that win, be really proud of yourself and know that you don't need to fight that hard ever again? Yeah, so... The way that I've been brought up and the way my fighting style was, was um, fighters fight. And I think when you face adversity every day, you are only used to fighting. That's all you're used to. And when you meet someone who hasn't had to face so much adversity, normally your willpower and your will to win will outdo theirs because they're not used to how to cope and how to deal. So... I've just always believed, like, that was my job. Like, if I'm dealing with so much outside the ring, outside the cage, that by the time I get in there, that's the easiest part for me to do. Or I've just put my most flawless performance on without having to draw from any of that. Um, Everything's just got more easier and more balanced, like we previously said, and it's not as... When you get to the top, sorry, I'm nowhere near the top, but I'm getting there. But now the fear of money isn't there. The fear of support, of not having money, not having a support system, not making weight, not being good enough at the, at the biggest level, none of that's there anymore. All I have to do is enjoy training. Sometimes it's not fun, but there wasn't really one session or whole fight camp that I didn't enjoy. Mm. Um. Or it was so much different to the UFC London fight camp. Do you find yourself looking for pressure or looking... Because, you know, we get caught in a circle. Yeah, you have people to have who are sh- used to adversity, how do, you get, how do you get out of that? I said to my mum, our life is go... There's a, there was a, a girl I trained with in America called Christy, actually, and she said to me, she said, you expect someone to pull the rug from your feet any time you're truly happy. Mm. You just look for it because that's all you've ever known. And she was like... It's not coming now. Like, you just need to sit happy with yourself. And we have this, like, self-sabotage moment. Like, I said it to my mum, I noticed her behaviour. I said, you're trying to sabotage this. Like, whatever she's got going on at the minute. I said, you're trying to sabotage yourself. I said, because that's all we are used to. And I said, and it needs to change. We have to break We have to break this cycle. So a lot of people do that. A lot of people self-sabotage. Because you can't believe it's going that well, like... And then you have to fuck it up. <laughs> just like. I said, how? What tips do you have for people to? Uh, just uh, I don't know. Believe what's gonna be is gonna be, and just what's good for you won't pass you by. Are you religious? Is it faith? Because there's a lot of there's a faith there. The, it's more spiritual spirituality. Um, I was grew grew up. My mum. The whole family is Irish Catholic, both sides, so all of that is in us, but. My mum's always believed in a higher power and following um, the 12-step programme and being in NA and being in recovery, you you say God and that's who you pray, like say your prayers to and, and your affirmations and you talk to, but it doesn't mean, like, Jesus is dad. Do you mm. know what I mean? It's like... It's, a guy on a cloud with a beard. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, yeah. it's no, it's like whatever you want to... Whatever, Whatever you want to talk to and what you want to speak to, you speak to. But I do think when it comes down to that kind of thing, I think I am very, very, very spiritual. Um, You have some things you put in place and that's what I really want to share with listeners who, 
you know, need help in those areas as well yeah. and also see what you've done and are inspired by it. But I know, like, I hope you don't mind me saying, you have a, a WhatsApp group with some friends where you, where you yeah, it's called, share gratefulness. Yeah, it's called Gratitude. So I, mean, I was literally talking about this the other day. My mate Lauren just is one of the girls in it and she is someone since I was 60 and I looked up to and I wanted to be here. And she was like, like, um, we all worked for the fire service for a charity in the fire service together when we was kids, football coaching in the community. But she kept on going to these levels, levels, and levels, and I was just always wanting to be here. And she said, she's just left her job to move on to bigger and better things. And she said, but one of the big things in which she said was, she didn't realise how amazing every female in her life is a strong, independent woman and is leading in their field. Mm -hmm. So in this gratitude group, there's a firewoman, a CSI woman, um, she's like the head of social care now in Berry. I fight. Um, this one who manages Aldi, but it's it's like managing a shop and a superstore. Yeah. And like so uh, strong women. Yeah, like everyone is is leading the thing. But on a Monday, we say f three goals we want to achieve. Every day, you're supposed to say something that you're thankful for. And I say, because I love my music, you've got to put one new song in the group um, every Sunday night. But that's something I got from my mum and something that she does with her girls. I just copied it. And I've got an Irish gratitude as well, which my English gratitude fume about, because they're like, how many gratitude groups have you got? <laughs> but I was like, me different fighting people, my Irish girls who fight in Bellator and train over there, they bring something different, but I still want to share that with them. Do you know what I mean? So you're actively putting out how you feel, being very grateful, and I guess vis visualising the future. That's it. I think, do you know, that's all I've done since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I've always said how I feel, and it's not always been in the right way, Leila. This is like, I'm still working on that now. Um, be it if I'm in a fight camp, I don't think properly. I don't think because your body's tired and you can respond a bit ratty and that's not the best way in which to do it. Or if people don't like confrontation, you need to realise like how to weird stuff when you're trying to do that kind of thing. But um, you have to talk, something you've taught me a lot, you have to talk about your feelings. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And once you talk about them, then, I don't know, two years I've been coming to <laughs> sending you texts yeah. in my life, like when I'm feeling, feeling the angst. But... That's what the group of girls is there for and the chain of girls and the chain of command, isn't it? Well, Molly, thank you so much for no talking problem. to me today. No problem. That was awesome. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm going wrong. Yeah, I'm <laughs> oh, nice one. That was awesome. Thank yeah. you, babe. Sorry, that was heavier than you probably expected. No, but we no, I didn't cry in it. I didn't There was have a point at the beginning oh. where I felt like, oh, I need to not go there as I feel bad. Sorry, mate. I might do. So awesome to hang out with Molly today and to talk to her outside of a fight space more in depth about how she thinks and how she works herself out and improves herself and there's a lot a lot for me to take on there I loved it great spending time with her time to go back to London